Hi everybody, how are you today? My name is Brian Barron. I'm the director of skincare research for Paula's Choice Skincare out of Seattle, Washington, USA. But we are, as many of you know, around the world. We are available throughout Europe, the UK, uh, most of the Asian countries, or most, sorry, most of the countries in Asia, uh, including Korea. Uh, where we have a lot of uh, special Paula's Choice fans there. China, uh, we are available uh, in limited distribution in India. It's just fascinating um, that our products and our messaging have just really stretched around the world. And uh, so I'm here every couple of weeks to do different uh, chats on topics related to skincare and really all things beauty. So today's topic is going to be about how to choose uh, a moisturizer for your face. Huge topic, lots to unpack here. Um, I want to uh, know what your pain points are, as they say. So uh, in the uh, questions box, you know, let me know what, what struggles you've had in trying to find the best moisturizer for your skin type. I'm gonna discuss some of the moisturizing type products <clears throat> that I use in my personal routine. Uh, this has evolved over the years. Um, there was a point where I was loyal to a, a specific moisturizer from Paula's Choice, that being the one in our skin balancing line. It used to be called Skin Balancing Moisture Gel. Uh, I worked closely with Paula years ago to help formulate this. Um, and by formulate, I mean putting together the formula on paper. Um, you know, full disclosure, as many of you know, I'm not an actual chemist. I know a lot about ingredients, a lot about formularies and the technology behind them and all that fun stuff, but uh, put me in a lab and I'm pretty useless. <laughs> so <laughs> other than saying, did you use this? Did you use that? Did you use that in this amount? Okay. Um, so the Skin Balancing Moisture Gel is now known as Skin Balancing Invisible Finish Moisture Gel. Uh, still a great product, but my needs have changed uh, over the years uh, and, and I've adapted the moisturizers that I use um, with the changing needs of my skin. And along with that comes, I think for a lot of us, texture preference changes. And then secondary to that, but still important, is how does the texture of your moisturizer, how well does it play with the other ingredients, not the other ingredients, the other products in your routine? So let's say maybe you've tried, you've got a moisturizer that you've used for several years, don't see any reason to switch, but then you your eye catches this new serum or this new discoloration type product, and you start incorporating that into your routine, and you realize that the combination of this new product with your moisturizer isn't so hot. It doesn't feel so good or it doesn't look good. Maybe you get some pilling or something like that. Maybe you even get some irritation, and you determine that the treatment type product, just to use this example, uh, is the one that you really want to keep using because it is specifically addressing a concern you have about your skin. Um, you know, most of us are using moisturizers uh, first and foremost to keep our skin hydrated. I'm going to discuss how a great moisturizer uh, will do much more than that, and I'm also going to be talking about. Uh, I'm going to be addressing some of the questions that. Um, let me make sure I have that up, my little questions list <clears throat> that our social media team sent me that in terms of what, what are you, or what is our community wanting to know most about moisturizers and how to choose the right one. But first, um, a quick update. Uh, we had a, um, well, two things. Yeah, we had a fantastic meeting with the, the team at Unilever last week. Um, I, I've been very enthusiastic about joining the Unilever uh, stable of brands. I think that they are just a tremendous company and the more that I have gotten to know the people and the principles and the ethics behind Unilever, the more reassured I am. And, and I say that from the, coming from the standpoint of not being really that nervous or worried about this whole transition to begin with, um, but it was nice to put faces to names, have those discussions in real time, um, and really get to see firsthand how much Unilever just adores Paula's Choice. Uh, and, and we 
really found a great home with them. And I'm so, so excited for what the future holds. Um, it's, I honestly and truly feel it's only going to get better. Um, better information, even better products. So um, yeah, I'm talk to people who've been with companies for 20 plus years as I have been for Paula's Choice and then to get to this point in your career and feel like really you've just kind of been given a shot in the arm, so to speak, it's wonderful. You know, I, I, I had no intention of, you know, the latter half of my career feeling like I was stagnating or anything like that. And I'm not saying I had gotten to that point, but, you know, the longer you're with a company in a certain role, you know, people tend to feel that way. Um, so on a personal note, really happy about that. And we recently started um, putting together some plans for remodeling the kitchen uh, in our home. And it really is the only, it's the central room of the house and it's really the room that we haven't done much to other than some quickie cosmetic upgrades. Um, still have the same countertops as when we moved in, still have the same cabinetry, which I'm fairly certain are the original cabinets from when this house was built in the late 60s. Um, I mean, they're still in good working order, but I don't know how many of you have um, gone through a kitchen remodel, but I'm very, <laughs> I shouldn't be as surprised as I am and how quickly the costs add up. You know, for example, a few years ago, we remodeled the master bathroom in the house, and that that cost more than I was anticipating, but not a lot more, and the extra expense was largely because we decided we wanted certain features and were willing to accept that these features were more costly than doing it another way. And we thought, you know, this is a frequently used room. We're going to be in this house for a while, and, and we want it the way we want it. And, and we're fortunate enough to be able to um, uh, pay for that, even though both of us are kind of like, God, we wish it wasn't so expensive. And what I was consistently told was that remodeling a bathroom is more expensive than remodeling a kitchen. So I, I had this price in mind, knowing what we paid to remodel the bathroom, which was a, a total reno, total gut job. Um, and then we're looking at doing less, uh, I mean, to me, it's less renovating in the kitchen, but it's, it's coming out to be just as much, if not more. So I'm kind of like disillusioned right now, but we will get through it. And um, again, very fortunate to be in a position where, where we're able to do this. So let's talk moisturizers. And then I'll take some of those common questions. And again, you guys can ask your questions as, as we go along. Please do. Um, moisturizers, it really is more of the, the name is more applicable to the step in your skincare routine than it really is or needs to be for the product itself. <clears throat> the reason I say this is because most people tend to think of a moisturizer as being a cream or a lotion, you know, and it's something that you put on to hydrate, improve the look and feel of your skin from like a suppleness standpoint, you know, managing dry skin. Um, they, they tend to be thought of as richer, creamier lotion type products, and that is not what everyone needs. There, there are skin types that absolutely need those attributes, and then there's, <clears throat> and it really is almost a 50-50 split. There are other skin types that don't need that <clears throat> creaminess, that emollients, those, those oils and thickeners that dry skin needs. Um, so what are they supposed to do? And luckily, there are a myriad of options that you can choose from. And if you fall on the combination skin to oily skin side of the skin spectrum, I'm classic combination skin, <clears throat> you can use products that aren't necessarily labeled moisturizer. <clears throat> as, a, as a told you, I was going to use some personal examples, and one of them is the Earth Sourced Power Berry Serum from Paula's Choice. I will often use this <clears throat> as my hydrator, either morning and or evening, um, when my skin is not, when I feel like with what I'm layering, I'm getting enough hydration. And where I feel this kind of seals the deal, and this drives home the point, 
is that what any moisturizer <clears throat> needs to contain is a mix of antioxidants, skin repairing, or sometimes referred to as skin replenishing or barrier replenishing, barrier repairing ingredients, and skin restoring ingredients, which we sometimes will refer to as cell communicating ingredients. Those are the three buckets of ingredients that all skin types need. And those ingredients don't have to feel thick, creamy, or oily, or occlusive. They, in fact, most of them are in their raw form, <clears throat> very lightweight, fluid, uh, and therefore they are compatible and beneficial for all skin types. So this Powerberry Serum is a great example because it gives, it's a very lightweight hydrating base uh, with uh, several different berry extracts, which are potent sources of polyphenolic type antioxidants. Um, that is a long way of saying that this serum not only steps in as my moisturizer, but is also giving me a nice mix of those antioxidant ingredients. Some replenishing. Um, there are other products in my routine in that case. Uh, that I like the peptide booster or the retinol booster or clinical retinol bacuchiol serum that I will use for um, the other ingredients on that list that I mentioned um, because the, the, the ratios of those in our formulas um, will ebb and flow depending on what the desired uh, result of the product is. We generally try to include a nice mix of those ingredients in every leave-on product but some of them uh, have a higher amount of one or the other, and the Powerberry Serum would be a good example of that because that one contains a higher amount of antioxidants. So choosing a moisturizer doesn't necessarily come down to looking for a product that has that creamier or lotion texture. If you have combination skin, breakout prone skin, even breakout prone skin that's also dry, or oily skin, your best bet is to look for gel, liquid, or fluid type textures. And yes, that can include serums. So again, going back to that Power Berry Serum, I will sometimes layer that over one of our other boosters or serums that I'm using for a different purpose other than moisture, hydration, uh, and, and in, a, in a texture and a format that's right for my skin type and preferences. When you have very dry to de very dry to very dry and, and or dehydrated skin, you're going to want to look for something that's a little bit richer. But if your dehydrated skin is also if you've got that um, dry underneath and oily on top thing going on, which is pretty common for dehydrated skin then you'd, you'd still want to use something that is more cream gel than a straight cream. And a good example of that texture is the Radiance Renewal Mask that we sell, which if you haven't tried that yet, uh, and you have, uh, that is my go-to from Paul's Choice for uh, an overnight product that really can substantially address dullness and dehydration. Uh, it, it's meant to be kind of slathered on. It's a thicker cream gel, but it doesn't feel too heavy. Um, it almost makes your skin look glossy, um, and which is fine with me. I'll go to bed like that, and I wake up the next morning, and it's just like, I literally it look like I got three or four more hours of sleep than I did because it's just, just like such a complexion picker-upper. So um, that's another great example of something in our line that isn't technically... A moisturizer it's not labeled as such but you could use it in that uh, fashion for that purpose if you so desire and I absolutely think if you have or struggle with dehydrated skin that's a great option to try the um, other couple of products that I use um, on a regular basis um, two of our newer moisturizers that have very different textures so, and these are my own personal products, so I apologize that they're not like the most pretty. Um, as you can see, they're loved. <laughs> the water infusing electrolyte moisturizer uh, kind of has, let me get some down here. It comes out and it looks, it looks kind of thick. It almost, you know, it looks like a thick cream, but then it has what, what's called a water break. So literally, as soon as it contacts skin, it thins out to this refreshing kind of uh, thin but still hydrating uh, watery feel 
Um, and of course, moisturizing with plain water isn't a good idea uh, because the water, as soon as the water evaporates, your skin is right back where it started from. So even in a formula like this, the water being the first ingredient is paired with other ingredients like glycerin, like various fatty acids that help keep the water, uh, the, the right amount of water in skin's uppermost layer. Some of it is going to evaporate. That's, that's part of what happens when the product dries on your skin. But the goal is to transport enough of that water into the, the skin layers where it's needed and then include it with ingredients, in this case, the electrolytes that help it move to where it needs to be in skin, and then include other ingredients that help keep that water from escaping in a process um, often referred to in the research as transepidermal water loss or tool. The other one I like, and coincidentally it's in the, the same color, is our Omega Plus Complex Moisturizer. This one has more of a cream texture, uh, it looks fairly thick, but it's kind of souffle-like, and just I just love the way this feels. And I started using it shortly after we launched it, because what I'm finding at this point in my skin life is that even though I still have an oily T-zone, my cheeks, <clears throat> and particularly the skin on my neck, uh, I always take any moisturizer or hydrator from face to neck. I mean, don't don't stop right here. Your neck is just as exposed as your face for the most part, unless you're a big fan of turtlenecks. Um, but take care of your neck just like you would your face is the message. But the Omega Complex Moisturizer is the ideal texture for the drier areas of my combination skin because they haven't gone all the way to what I've come to understand people with dry skin um, experience and how they describe, you know, how their skin feels all over. So for example, my cheeks aren't feeling tight and they're not necessarily looking flaky. Um, but even with a very gentle cleanser, I mean, I can just tell my, my, my cheeks are just, I'm just not getting the level of moisture or oil there that I used to when I was younger. And I would really more describe my skin as being oily or normal to oily all over as opposed to just you know, certain areas of the face. So let me touch on a few other things. Let me pull up those questions again. Um, I wanted to talk about the, there, there's, it's definitely a myth that oily skin, people with oily skin don't need moisture or moisturizers. You do, but what you don't, you, you need those ingredients that I mentioned earlier uh, in the broadcast. You need those antioxidants, those skin replenishing ingredients, those skin restoring ingredients. There's a long list of antioxidants, too many to name. Green tea, pomegranate, those are vitamin C, those are some well-known known ones. Examples of skin repairing or, or replenishing ingredients are going to be glycerin, ceramides, omega fatty acids, cholesterol, um, phytosphingosine and sphingosine, which help skin make more ceramides, and then your skin restoring ingredients are going to be all of pretty much all of your peptides, your retinol, niacinamide, lecithin, uh, and ingredients and carnosine. That's not in as many products as those other ingredients, but those are those are the bigger ones in there. Hyaluronic acid actually has a distinction of being both a skin restoring and a skin replenishing, uh, repairing ingredient and an antioxidant. It isn't like an amazing antioxidant, but it does have that benefit too. It's kind of a, a triple threat for skin, which I think is kind of neat. Um, okay, why does somebody need, it, let me backtrack a bit. If you have oily skin, you don't need a traditional moisturizer and you certainly don't need and likely would reject a cream. But you can give your skin those great types of ingredients I just mentioned in the form of a serum in the form of a toner, in the form of a lighter weight moisturizer that has a gel fluid lotion or liquid type texture. And we offer those in Paul's Choice and other brands are starting to offer more variety in that range as well. But just keep in mind, like for example, if you have very oily skin and you're thinking, anytime I try a moisturizer, it just feels too slick, it just feels too heavy, makes my makeup slide right off my face, uh-uh, not gonna do it. Um, take a look at toners, gentle, alcohol-free, fragrance-free toners, such as those we offer at Paula's Choice. Again, you can find those from other brands. 
Um, not as easy. Um, a lot of brands kind of skip the toner step. I happen to love it. I think it's very important. Um, and why is that so? Because even the gentlest cleansers uh, are still taking some away from your skin just by virtue of how they work. So following that with a toner immediately gives skin back what was taken away in a very lightweight, readily absorbable fashion. Uh, and then of course, because none of us cleanse perfectly every single time, and I think a big part of that is because when you're in the rinsing step, if you're doing it in the shower or over your sink, you've got your eyes closed. You're not able to like look and pay attention to make sure that you're getting every area. And if you're wearing sunscreen on a daily basis, and I hope you are, uh, and sunscreen and or makeup, you want to make sure you get all of that off at night so that uh, those types of products don't build up and lead to clogged pores and a dull complexion. So that's another area where a well-formulated toner can step in is that it gets those last traces of those uh, sunscreen and makeup type products off of your skin from around your jawline, from around your nostrils, from up here, your hairline. Now maybe you're double cleansing or you have a separate makeup remover that you like to use uh, and you're feeling like, okay, I'm, 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 I, I know my cleansing routine is, is really taking it all off, so I don't need a toner for that. There is still lots of great reasons to use a well-formulated toner. And if you have oily skin or very oily skin, a toner can really be the only moisturizer, moisturizer in air quotes, that you need. And you'll be giving your skin all of those wonderful ingredients. Okay. The other thing I wanted to mention, packaging. Packaging matters across the board for skincare, both in terms of visual appeal and everyday functionality, but also for formulary efficacy and stability. And this is where, those are the two areas where uh, it matters most for moisturizers, uh, whether they're labeled as such or not. And that is why buying any well-formulated moisturizer for your face in a jar is a bad idea. So separate from the hygiene issue that comes from dipping your finger into a water-based product every single day, or even if you use one of those little spatulas that come with them, those can get contaminated and it can be very difficult to keep them scrupulously clean. Uh, if you can even keep track of them to begin with because they never give you any means of... Actually, there was one company a while back that did do this little clever storage thing inside the cap. I can't remember who that was. Um, but that does not negate the other issue that jar packaging presents is that the majority of the most beneficial ingredients for your skin at any age are light and or air sensitive. So from the first use, from the first time you take that lid off, those ingredients exposed to light, exposed to air, they start deteriorating. Um, you know, do they deteriorate completely? Don't know for sure. You'd have to individually test every product, but we know that they it, it is an immediate phenomenon that is not getting any better with subsequent uses. Um, so really, there are regardless of whether you're you know all on board for using nothing but Paula's Choice, or you're using a mix of our products and somebody else's, or you're not using Paula's Choice at all. Uh, in which case, you know what's going on? Give us a try. Um, just don't buy moisturizers in jars. It, it's really, especially if you're buying expensive moisturizers in the skincare world, I can't think of a bigger waste of money. Uh, it's just, it, it, it's like a crying shame to, to spend that much for something that's in a jar. Um, so I'll step off my soapbox <laughs> for that one. Um, let's see, what, are, what else did I want? Oh, do you need moisturizer under your SPF? And what's the difference between moisturizers for AM and PM? That latter one is simpler because really the primary difference is that your AM moisturizer should contain sunscreen, offer some you know, sun protection of at least SPF 30 or greater, and your nighttime moisturizer doesn't need to contain sunscreen. That's the easy answer. A bit more... Um, a bit more detail on that question would be that for some people, depending on how many other products you're applying at the same time in your routine, morning and evening, you may want to experiment with different textures to use in the morning and at night. For example, let's say that you have a daytime moisturizer with sunscreen that 
definitely gives you some hydration and you otherwise love the aesthetics of it, but you have drier skin and maybe it's not moisturizing enough, but for all other intents and purposes, you love this product, but you just wish it had a little bit more moisture to it. You may be, you may be someone in that case that would want to layer a non-SPF moisturizer, maybe even something lighter, like the water infusing electrolyte moisturizer, under your moisturizer with SPF. And that blend is gonna get you to the uh, comfort level you like to be at for your dry skin. You may need an even richer product than that to wear under your lighter weight SPF. You'll need to experiment and see what combination looks and feels best for you. On the other hand, in the evening, you depending again depending on if if you're like me and you use several more products in your pm routine than you do your am routine you may not want uh what's traditionally thought of as a heavier night cream type moisturizer because what you've applied before that your exfoliant your booster maybe a dark spot treatment a serum you know, after those different layers, and, and, you know, in my case, it would be toner on top of or underneath all of that, I don't need a, a creamier, richer, emollient nighttime moisturizer. I can get away with something lighter, or depending on the time of year and how my skin's looking and feeling, nothing at all in terms of a moisturizer step. So you really need to kind of just experiment with that, consider what you're using in your routine, how many steps, uh, and then adjust accordingly. Um, cleanser, I highly recommend a leave-on exfoliant and a moisturizer with sunscreen are the primary must-haves. I would, I would just put as the cornerstone in any skincare routine, any age, any skin type, any ethnicity, any concern, that's your starting point, you know, to build that nice, um, I guess, I was going to say house of cards, but that didn't sound right because House of Cards typically refers to something that is delicate and fragile and about to fall over at the slightest provocation, and that's not how we want to think of our skincare routines, right? So I think I covered differences between moisturizers for AM and PM. You do not need special ingredients at night that your skin doesn't need during the day. It's fine to use products with different ingredients day and night in terms of maybe your daytime product contains a different mix of antioxidants, than your nighttime one, but your skin needs those types of ingredients around the clock. So yes, in terms of skin uh, replenishing ingredients, antioxidants, skin restoring ingredients, variety can be the spice of life there. Um, but it does not mean that your skin is utilizing those ingredients more so at night than they do during the day. It, they, they, your skin needs those ingredients around the clock. Okay, and then do you need moisturizer under your SPF? Let's talk about that a little bit further. It really depends on your skin's needs and, and primarily on your on your skin type. And then, you know, and just in the in the category of SPF, sunscreens for the face, um, I really want you to find one that you love using and that you love how it looks and how it feels and how it works under your makeup if you wear makeup. So, and you may find that your sweet spot product in that regard isn't necessarily the texture you would gravitate toward based on your skin type. You know, because when it comes to, or not, yeah, when it comes to moisturizer with SPF, there's a lot more criteria that need to be satisfied uh, and it's tricky. Uh, and at times it can feel darn near impossible to create an aesthetically pleasing moisturizer with sunscreen because you have to leave enough room for the active ingredients, the UV filters, to go in and do their thing, to get to that SPF uh, value that you want on your label. Uh, and so sometimes that can mean, well, in order to get to SPF 50, we have to make some aesthetic compromises. And this is true for any brand. It's just the nature of formulating with the available UV filters we have, and that includes the available UV filters in other parts of the world, because all of them have their pros and cons in terms of aesthetics. Uh, and, just, and some of them have pros and cons in terms of compatibility with other ingredients. So it can be tricky. Needless to say, you need a moisturizer under your moisturizer with SPF 
if you don't feel that your moisturizer with SPF is giving you enough hydration, moisture for your skin to feel comfortable on its own. You know, if you if you pair another moisturizer without sunscreen under your moisturizer with sunscreen and you find that that combination feels a lot better uh, and you want to keep doing that until you, you know, one day maybe a sunscreen, a moisturizing sunscreen will come along that can really just be your one and done type product and you won't have to layer in that capacity. Um, the other thing to keep in mind is that it's a, even if a product with SPF for the face is not called or labeled a moisturizer with sunscreen, almost all of them are. And the reason for that is because the UV filters that we have in play, both the synthetic like your avobenzone and octanoxate and the mineral titanium dioxide, zinc oxide, all of those do best are easiest to stabilize in uh, what's called an emulsion that is either water and oil or oil and water. Um, so unless what you're considering is a solvent-based fluid, because you can utilize some of these sunscreen ingredients in like a, a high alcohol, denatured alcohol base, but you wouldn't want to put that on your face. Those are typically your spray-on sunscreens. That amount of alcohol can be problematic, especially on a daily basis. Uh, and you're going to get a much more elegant user experience if you look for moisturizer with sunscreen that comes in a lotion or cream base. Some of them are cream gel. Um, some of them are true gel formulas. Uh, those are getting harder to find. And I think the reason for that is because a lot of those, uh, a lot of the gel bases for uh, that work with the UV filters either uh, require a fair amount of the denatured alcohol for solubility. Um, and again, that can be an issue for irritation and dryness. Um, or they, uh, in order to keep that gel texture and get that nice gel feel, the, the thickeners that are employed tend to roll and ball up on the skin. So you get that nice initial gel feel, but then as you're massaging it in, you will notice that it kind of like starts to ball up and come off on your hands, and of course we don't want that either. Okay. The other thing that I want to mention, I'm going to start taking your questions here, is that for the, the health of your skin, avoid facial moisturizers that overload on the fragrance. Ideally they should be fragrance free. Fragrance really isn't a friend to anyone's skin. Um, and avoid problematic ingredients that often show up in facial moisturizers that you may not be on the lookout for, such as certain fragrant plant extracts in like the, the rose family, the lavender family, the citrus or mint family. I know they can sound enticing. They're, they're natural. They're pretty plants. Um, but the aromatic, and it's not that none of those ingredients have benefit for skin because all of those I mentioned actually do have some amount of beneficial compounds in them, but in order to get those, in most cases, you're also getting the problematic compounds. And given the number of natural ingredients, I, I'm not an anti-natural ingredient. Paula's Choice isn't anti-natural ingredient. We want you to use the natural ingredients that are not going to irritate your skin and that research has shown can actually uh, help skin rather than either A, harm skin, or B, help and harm skin. So you're kind of on this seesaw, um, and, and why bother with that? Why put your skin through that confusion when there are plenty, truckloads of plant extracts that don't present any risk? It's just, it's all, all good, no bad. Um, and it, whenever you're faced with that choice in life, I, you know, it's obvious which one you should choose. Okay. Claire Shea says, hello. Hello, Claire. Uh, the King says, hey, Brian, nice to see you again. Is it true that ceramides need to be in the specific and right ratio in the product to really work and do something? And also, can discoloration serum be used in the same routine with retinol or tretinoin? Thanks. I feel like I just, like in the last chat, we had this ceramide specific and right ratio question. Generally, um, ceramides work best when they are in a 3-1-1 ratio with other types of, of fatty acids. It doesn't necessarily have to be specific fatty acids um, like cholesterol and linoleic acid, for example. Cosmetic chemists who are working with ceramides have that working familiarity 
uh, are aware of the ratio that ceramides need to be in in order to be most effective. Um, the other thing is that ceramides, uh, even on their own, are fairly smart ingredients. You know, and, and your skin, uh, they're, they're, they belong to a group of ingredients that we consider skin natural ingredients. And by that we mean you put them on your skin and your skin's like, hey, I know you. Come on in. Have a drink. Pull up a chair. Stay a while. <laughs> you know, they, they, they understand what these ingredients are there to do and they welcome them in. Uh, and, and there are um, substances and other factors and processes that go on within the skin that we don't even think about. For a good example of this is the enzymatic conversion of retinol to its active form, which the, the, that the cell can use, which is retinoic acid. That conversion happens by certain enzymes that are naturally present in the skin. You don't have to do anything special yourself. The chemist doesn't have to necessarily do anything special to make that conversion happen. It just does. The chemist's job is to use an appropriate amount of retinol with, uh, in, an, in an appropriate formula that helps to keep it stable, that can encourage penetration. But once that happens, your skin takes it from there. Uh, and so that's kind of how I think of ceramides for the most part. As long as they are in a base that includes other replenishing ingredients and fatty acids, uh, and it's almost always better to have more than one ceramide as opposed to just one. Um, I, I don't think this the, the whole ratio is something that you need to get too concerned about. Um, it, it's definitely worth discussing, but it's not necessarily, at least I have not seen it in copious research where it's like, if it's not this equation, you're not getting efficacy. Um, in certain circumstances, depending on the formula, you may get greater or lesser efficacy, but you're still reaping the benefits of the ceramides and the ingredients that accompany them. And then in terms of using the discoloration repair serum in the same routine with retinol or tretinoin, uh, yes, you can. If you're using both retinol and tretinoin at the same time and your skin's gotten to a point where you're like, okay, everything's good, you're tolerating this, that combination, anytime you want to introduce another more bioactive product like the discoloration repair serum, I would just start slowly. So instead of applying the discoloration repair serum once daily or twice daily, apply once daily, morning or evening. Um, most people like applying it at night. <clears throat> every other, or sorry, not every other, every third night. And then build from there. Note your skin's response if you're not seeing signs of an adverse reaction, and I don't think most people would, um, but it's worth noting, it's just something to be vigilant about. Um, then you what, go, go a couple of weeks following that application pattern, and then you can step up to um, once every other night, and then another week or two like that, and then maybe moving up to once daily, and potentially even twice daily, depending. Katie says, love all the products you mentioned. Any new products coming soon that you're able to give a hint about? Ooh, I get asked this almost every live chat. It's kind of funny. Um, let me see. We do have some, of course, we have some products in the works and products in the pipeline. Um, but no, nothing I can let, nothing I can let out of the bag. Um, it's one of the things that we are actively working on is making sure <clears throat> that our current portfolio, our selection of products, is as robust and differentiated uh, as it should be. And, and through that, through those conversations, we've discovered some areas of opportunity um, for newer products that would either address a need that isn't being addressed or isn't being addressed as completely as it could be now, uh, which is a bit shocking given the number of products we have, um, or there, there, are, there is new information that would let us formulate a product to more successfully target a certain concern, uh, either as a new way of going after that concern, uh, that's how the discoloration repair serum came about, or as a way that would complement existing therapies. So there are certain 
products and ingredients that can only take you so far. Well, actually, all of them only take you so far. But then sometimes we'll find newer ingredients and or technologies or combinations of ingredients. That's kind of the fun part about it for me is, and I think that's something that Paula's Choice does really well, is how we combine different ingredients together. I think we kind of do that in a really unique way that maximizes the potential benefit uh, of, of each one. Uh, and not actually not even maximize it, it's, it's, it, it magnifies it. It's just, it's just we, we're always into this really cool synergy between ingredients. Um, so I think that's, that's kind of a general idea of, of what you can expect to see from us in the next year or so. All right, poppy flower. Brian, I have rosacea and want to know if it is really true that redness prone skin should not use a richer moisturizer because I love them. I love common omega moisturizer also for winter skin, uh, also for wintertime skin recovery, which is another one of our um, sub brands. Um, I have never heard that poppy. That doesn't even make any sense to me. Um, the only thing I can think of is it because sometimes people uh, who struggle with rosacea uh tend their 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 redden areas also tend to feel warm you know you you get those um you get those rosacea flushes as they're called and they can often be accompanied by the skin feeling warm or even hot to the touch and the thinking may be that putting in a, a creamy emollient or occlusive type moisturizer over that is going to trap that warmth and heat you know not not to the point where it can't get out, but it's just going to take longer for that to dissipate. And then in the meantime, that is potentially making the flare, the, fl the flushed appearance worse. If that is what you are experiencing, and, and you can test this yourself, take your favorite moisturizer, apply it as usual to one side of your face, leave the other side of your face bare, you know, and you kind of have to do this around the timing of when you think you may be having a rosacea flush episode uh, and, and see how your skin feels. And if you notice that the side with the moisturizer feels, you know, more warm or hot and the redness seems to be worse. And then on the side without the creamy moisturizer, it it's red, but it's not as red. And when you, you know, touch your cheek, it's warm, but it's not as warm. So that's kind of the, the A-B testing that you need to do at home. To determine if this is going to be true for you uh, and if it does tend to be true then you may want to consider using a lighter weight moisturizer um, but for the most part as a general rule do people with rosacea need to avoid creams no if you have dry skin the creamy texture rosacea or not is is ideal you just want to make extra certain that your uh, moisturizer when you have rosacea uh, when you're dealing with that because rosacea is is essentially a a skin disorder that is also characterized by highly sensitive highly reactive skin <clears throat> there's more to it than that and that is not to say that everyone who has sensitive skin has rosacea or will get rosacea but there is a correlation to be made and so that is why it is especially important that you make sure that your moisturizer is free from any known irritating ingredients including either synthetic or natural sources of fragrance, uh, denatured alcohol, any type of mint, menthol, menthol derivatives, uh, all of those should not be on the table. You want a, as gentle and as soothing of a formula as possible. Okay. Mrs. Uh, Mrs. Flory W. Oh, I've missed the live. I can't wait to watch the replay. All the best from New Zealand. Oh, hello to New Zealand. That is a country I have never been to, uh, and it's on my bucket list. Every time I watch the Lord of the Rings trilogy, <clears throat> which I've watched several times, just that's a series I can just kind of put on. And, uh, you know, you've heard the term binge watching as it relates to television shows episode after episode after episode i'm like that with lord of the rings i can just go down and put those on and 12 hours later i'm like is it tuesday <laughs> and yeah and, and most of our good portion of those films were shot on location in and around new zealand uh and i just it's just breathtaking scenery so much love to you guys uh, Adriana, our thick moisturizer with ceramides like Cicaplast from La Roche, good for oily skin. If not, 
what else to use for irritations and light redness? Sycoplast from La Roche. I'm, I know that um, La Roche, as in La Roche Posay, has several products that start with Sica, uh, which is another name for Centella asiatica, which is a very good um, plant extract for antioxidant, anti-inflammatory skin soothing properties. Uh, we use it at Paula's Choice. Let me see if I can find that real quick to comment on. Sycoplast. Is it the balm? Do they have more than one? That's what I'm wondering because this says it's a balm. B5, $15. A lot of La Roche-Posay's formulas, and they do tend to avoid fragrance, which is yay. Um, yeah, I mean, they're, they're, they're fairly, they're fairly basic, um, you know, as in like could be ro more robust in terms of the, the good stuff, but this one, if this is the one that you're talking about, the Sycoplast uh, Balm, B-A-U-M-E, that's got the hydrogenated polyisobutene as its second ingredient, which is a fairly heavy duty emollient. Um, either polyisobutene or the hydrogenated form uh, tend to show up in a lot of lip glosses because it's just kind of a thick, tenacious emollient uh, and also has a fair amount of gloss to it. Uh, it's got your dimethicone glycerin shea butter blend, which is great. Love panthenol. Um, you know, you're getting fairly far down on the list before you start getting to the Sika part, and they are using the metacasicide, which is one of the active components in the Centella asiatica plant. I, it's a good ingredient, but I think using whole Centella asiatica extract uh, or using the metacasicide with the other components found in that plant, you know, whether listed as whole Centella or as their individual parts. I think, again, that's a great example of how this formula could have been better. So ultimately, um, and you know what? There's no ceramides listed in here. So that's interesting. I wonder if they're banking on like ceramides and some of the other ingredients. No, they just have the balm and the hand cream, so we must be talking about the balm. And it, I did not see you. You ideally, we want to see if you're looking for ceramides, you want to see them on the ingredient list. Um, but in terms of what else to use for light irritations uh, and, and and light redness, um, and our column repairing serum would be a good example uh, because it's a, a nice water-based serum texture. It's not greasy, slick, or oily. It doesn't have heavy emollients in it, and it does have um, a nice mix of ceramides. Our Omega Plus Complex Serum would be another one if you want something that ha is going to be more substantive in terms of emollients and oils, but still not feel greasy or occlusive or thick. Those would be two choices from, from us. Um, the other ones from the looking fabulous. Oh my goodness. Yeah, okay, the balm. Yeah, I'm not seeing ceramides in the balm. Uh, unless La Roche-Posay being an international brand, the ing I'm, I'm looking at the ingredient list that's sold here in the US. Uh, it could be different in Europe if that's where you're, you're asking the question from, it's possible. Uh, I've certainly seen that fairly consistently over the years, slightly different ingredients. Same brand, same product name, same packaging, different ingredients. It's frustrating. <laughs> anyway, that is, uh, I think we're going to cut out a little bit early. I'm not seeing, yeah, not seeing any other questions. I think just, just to recap on choosing and finding your best moisturizer, um, your skin type is the first criteria. Dry to very dry skin, you want the richer, thicker, creamier products, the balms. Uh, some, some of them are labeled as such. Um, normal or sometimes referred to as neutral skin, uh, which means skin that isn't really dry, it's not really oily, it's just kind of everything is seemingly as it should be. But as we age, 
as we incur more environmental damage, you are going to start needing those core group of ingredients that everyone's skin needs at some point, which are your antioxidants, your skin replenishing ingredients, and your skin restoring ingredients. Um, you can, if you have the, the normal neutral skin type, texture preference is, is at play. Whichever texture feels best to you is the way to go. And then combination skin, where you have uh, typically oily central part of the face, your T-zone, normal to dry skin on the cheeks. You can use uh, lightweight lotions, um, liquid cream gel or gel formulas. And if you have what I tend to think of as extreme combination skin, meaning that you are very oily in your T-zone uh, and you are actually dry or dehydrated routinely, on your cheeks, you may need two different moisturizers, two different textures. Um, for example, a serum. Maybe you use a lightweight serum like the Earth Source Power Berry all over, and that's more than enough hydration for your oily areas. And then you use a thicker traditional moisturizer like the Omega Plus Complex Cream on just your cheeks. And you're, when you're applying to your cheeks, you're applying away from the oily part of your face. And then if you have oily skin, you are going to want to look to liquid or gel textures. Um, avoid jar packaging. Look for opaque bottles as you are tubes, as you've been seeing me showcase throughout this hour. Um, Fragrance-free is best. If you have found your ideal moisturizer and it has a teensy, teensy bit of fragrance, you know, not, not great still. Uh, I, I really want you to use fragrance-free if you can find it, and I think that there are enough of them out there that you will find your perfect fragrance-free moisturizer. I think that's about it, and, you know. And, and then keep in mind, uh, keep in mind layering uh, and what else you're using in your routine, and, and how much hydration that's adding in terms of aesthetics, what you're experiencing and feeling. And uh, there is not a significant difference between daytime and nighttime formulas other than your daytime moisturizer should offer sun protection and have it be at least SPF 30 labeled broad spectrum. So um, let me make sure there's not. Oh, Salvador, I got it. Thank you so much. <laughs> oh, one more question uh, from someone who's, whose name is in a language that I sadly am unable to read. Hi, Brian. Can you please advise which step is primer before sunscreen or after? Oh, this is a this is this is why we did our primer with sunscreen, because the if the whole point of primer is to prep your skin for makeup. So the thinking is if you are using a primer without sunscreen during the day and then you follow with your moisturizer with sunscreen, which should ideally be the last morning skincare step pre-makeup, your primer isn't going to do as good of a job because part of what makes primers um, so great for makeup application is the finish that they leave. And when you're putting something like a sunscreen over the primer, you're kind of negating the fit. You're, now, now the finish your skin has pre-makeup is whatever the sunscreen primer combo is going to work out to be. Uh, again, that's why we did sunscreen in our primer, so that you can put it on over your moisturizer with sunscreen, and you're adding a bit more sun protection, but still getting the benefits of that nice primary finish. So, what is the answer to the question? Unless your foundation, or BB cream, or CC cream, or tinted moisturizer, has sunscreen in it as well, you still need to put your moisturizer with sunscreen as the last step. So that means it would go on over your primer. If your makeup product that you're putting all over your face, your, your foundation type product has sunscreen, then you can put your primer over your moisturizer with sunscreen and follow with that makeup with SPF. It isn't ideal. I do think you're gonna get some dilution of your moisturizer with sunscreen in terms of its efficacy, but I also see it as making up for that subtraction with the addition of the sunscreen in your foundation type product. So that is a that's how, it's not an easy question. I wish it had a very simple answer. There's different scenarios to look at. I think I explained it decently enough, and you can try different um, both of those options 
and see which one works best for you, or you can try our primer serum with SPF 30 and see if you like that even more. All right, guys, I am wrapping up. Thank you so much for joining me. Brian Barron, Director of Skincare Research at Paula's Choice Skincare, and I will see you 